Hello, everyone. We're gathering once again around God's Word, and that's such an important thing for us to do on a consistent basis, not just on videos like this, but with others and, and opportunities to study God's Word together with people and to reflect on what it says to us and uh, to be able to make applications. So that's that's really what part of our our um, relationship with the Lord is all about, so that we grow in Christ, so we become more and more like Jesus Christ, and, and you know, we should be conformed to His image, according to Romans 8 and other things, other passages. So that's important. We're gathered around God's Word. We open with prayer, as we always do. So please pray with me, if you would, as we prepare to uh, focus on God's Word. We're looking at Philippians chapter 3 today. We're continuing in our series, Abiding and Abounding in Hope, in Philippians chapter 3. We're going to look at that whole chapter. We're not going to uh, get bogged down in it. We're going to work through that chapter relatively uh, quickly and concisely. But we're going to see what it says as we recognize how it, it relates to us today. So please pray with me, as I said. Our Father, our God Almighty, I thank you for your faithfulness, for your Father approach to us. You are our Heavenly Father, and I praise you for that. I praise you for the way in which you have forgiven us. You've forgiven us from sin through Jesus Christ, the only one that could ever pay the price that would, would take the penalty for sin that was required. I praise you. I thank you. I adore you, Father, and I adore my, adore my Lord Jesus in light of all of this. I pray that others do too. I pray as we worship together today as we study, and, and that's a form of worship, yes, that our, our, we will recognize your presence, we'll sense your presence, we'll realize the power of the resurrection that transforms our lives. It, it, it raised Christ from the dead, and it transforms our lives, and I pray, Father, that we become more and more aware of that, more understanding of that, I desperately need your strengthening help on a day-by-day -day basis, Father. I fall short in various ways, and I, I'm sorry for those things. I thank you for your grace. Thank you for your forgiveness. And I pray, Father, that everyone that is listening today would have that sense of your power working in us to change us, to rearrange us, uh, to challenge us, too, and to make us more like Jesus. I ask that you'll help, help us to hear clearly, but before that, Father, I pray that you'll guide my mind and my mouth as I try to communicate the truths that are in this passage of Scripture. I praise you and thank you, and I ask your help through this time, Father. Guide, guard, and please bring about good results. I pray this in Jesus' name, and everyone I trust says, Amen. All right. Some years ago, I was teaching a Bible study, closing the study off, and we were taking prayer requests. And one of the younger ladies in the crowd, uh, she spoke up and says, Pastor Greg, would you please pray, the, pray for the rapture? And I thought, wow, somebody... 16, 17 years old, asking that we pray for the rapture. That kind of surprised me. And yet, a young lady went to a good Christian school, Christian high school, and, 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 and that, that, that's a possibility. But then there was a young man there in the crowd, and he quickly raised it. Pastor Greg, no, 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 no. Two weeks from now, I turn 16, and I get my driver's license, and I'd hate for the rapture to take place before my driver's license. And, you know, it's interesting we have things like that. That's, that's in, in a sense, a cute story. It, it, it's got a little bit of a humor to it. But it, it's a sad story in the sense that, you know, maybe not for a 16-year-old to say that, but as we are followers of Jesus Christ, one of the most glorious events that's ever going to take place is going to be the rapture. When Jesus Christ fulfills the promise that he made in John 14, he's, I'm going to prepare a place for you and... I'm doing this because where I am, I want you to be also, so I will come back and get you. And Jesus made that promise, and that is going to be actually the end of the earthly activity of the church. 
Now, we as followers of Christ are members of the church, and we will have a role in the kingdom that Christ will set up after the rapture, the tribulation, and when the millennial kingdom starts, we'll have a role in that. We'll find out that role at the judgment seat of Christ, actually. But the, the fact of the matter is, is many times I think, and throughout the last numbers of years, I heard a pastor speak recently, and he just remarked how over the last 30 to 40 years, there's been a, a growing ignorance, and basically not only just an ignorance, but an ignoring of the truth of God's prophetic promises. And we're looking at the whole concept of abiding and abounding. Yes, 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 abounding in hope. And that's what we're looking at in the series of messages. And I want us to understand that I said this last week too, it was part of the title, the driving force behind our faith is hope. And we should be eagerly awaiting our Lord's appearance. Now, as I say that, what, how does that relate to us today? How does that affect us now? It affects us because it should change our lifestyle. It should make us more desirous to share the gospel with others. It should make us recognize that there's going to come a day when Christ is going to snatch us up and take us to heaven, and he's going to review our lives, not to see if we're saved, because the only people that go to heaven in the rapture are going to be saved individuals. But he's going to comb through our lives. He's going to play the tapes of our lives, so to speak, and we will be rewarded for things that have honored him, that have brought glory to him. And then those rewards will go back to him, of course. But we're also going to be, in a sense, um, judged, not, con not condemned, but judged over the fact that there are some things we've done where we've missed opportunities, where we've not fulfilled the things that God desired. And basically, Jesus is going to ask us why. And we're going to be, whoa, that's a challenge. And that's why understanding the rapture is coming is something that reminds us that we ought to live every single day out of respect and reverence for God Almighty because He's watching he is taking an account of our lives, and there's going to be an accounting, an accountability that we're going to experience in the future. So I gave that clever, clever little story or that cute little story about those teenagers. But, you know, one of my favorite musicians of all time, and as I say this, he's a man that I, I think it was uh, 26 years ago last month or two months ago, he died on I-39 in Illinois. Uh, in, an, in a traffic accident. His name's Rich Mullins. Some of you are aware of Rich Mullins. Some of you probably are not. Many people are aware of the song, Our God is an Awesome God. Well, that was one of the songs he wrote. He wrote many songs that I, I, I just love the creativity and the uh, clever way in which he would communicate truth in his songs. And one of the things that was remarkable about, remarkable about Rich Mullins is that he consistently and constantly talked about wanting to go to heaven, looking forward to heaven. He had all kinds of music and songs that he expressed of his desire to go to heaven. And he died at a very young age because of a tra traffic accident, yes, but he's in heaven today because he loved the Lord Jesus Christ, he trusted Christ as Lord and Savior. And, you know, he looked forward to that, and he, in a certain sense, in an unexpected way, got his wish. But now the question is, how much do we look forward to heaven? And I've got three questions, or actually I've got four questions on my, my page here, that I want to ask as we get started. And I want all of us to answer these to ourselves. Number one, or actually first question, what are your three greatest desires? What are your three greatest desires? What do you desire? What are three things you desire? And, and as I say that, I know I didn't give you much time to answer that. You can think through that, maybe mark it down, think through it later, or maybe think through it for a few moments now as, as, as I just continue trying to express. But I'll say very clearly, when I was younger, my three, three greatest desires were probably like, like Paul, the young man that spoke of him, said, I want my driver's license. Yeah, I look forward to a driver's license. I look forward to getting married. I look forward to having children. I'm thankful I have grandchildren. Those are all desires that, we've, that I've had. 
Can't say those were my greatest desires necessarily. I, I had dreams at different times of being an athlete. But you know what? Right now, my three greatest desires is number one, I want to be like Jesus Christ. I want to be as much, I want my life to re, re, represent Jesus Christ as closely as possible. And as I say that, to be conformed to the image of Christ. Now, there's going to come a day where I will be completely conformed to the image of Christ. That's when the rapture takes place. I can also say that one of my greatest desires actually, too, is I would love to go to heaven by rapture. You know, I, I think that would be a glorious event. Now, I'll go to heaven by rapture one way or another, either from life or from the grave. But looking forward to the rapture, that, that's a great desire, too. And then I guess my third desire, I, I, I'm not sure what I'd say right this moment. Um, it may have any number of different aspects to, my, you know, the ministries that God's provided. It may have an aspect to my relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. But like I say, those are things that... that raised to the top for me, rise to the top for me. But as I say that, it's not always that way. Now, secondly, what do you want more than anything else? I already said mine. I want to be like Jesus. But some people say, well, I want peace on earth, or I want this, or I want that. And, you know, sometimes we have these, these things that you just, you look forward to it. You want it, you want it, you want it. And I could say very clearly, there are things that I've wanted in life in the past, and I've gotten those things, and I found out, you know what? They didn't satisfy. They didn't bring that sense of satisfaction or security. So my third question is, what gives you a sense of satisfaction or security? Do you find security in your bank account? Do you find security in your life insurance policies or your other investment policies? Do you find security in your family? Do you, do you look for safe places you know, in this world today, there's a lot of challenge, a lot of concern, and sometimes people, they need places where they can just feel safe and secure. But it's good for us to stop and think, what gives you a sense of satisfaction or security? And then finally, how does having hope in our eternal future influence our lives today? How does having hope in the rapture, in the promises God's made, in the various uh, prophecies we find in Scripture, how does having hope based on those things influence our lives today? And I want us to realize, yes, it should change the way we think. It should change the way we look at others or the way we treat others. It should change the way that we do various things in our lives. It should change our priorities. It changes our perspective or our perceptions on things. Having hope. And when I lose sight of that hope, I know people that have lost their hope, people that have lost their, their sense of desire for what the future might hold. They're very discouraged, they're, they're downtrodden, they're disgruntled, and that's common in our world today. And therefore, having hope in our eternal future has an influence upon us if, in fact, that hope is it, it's, it's something that gives us a sense of rest, a sense of resolve. So now where are we going today? We're looking at Philippians chapter 3. And this study is going to be a little bit different than it sometimes is. I'm trying to uh, make some various... Um, I'm, I'm adapting some things. I'm trying to, to uh, do this in a way that it, it, it might be more received, more, more acceptable to some folks. I'm not changing anything in the scriptures, no. I'm trying to make a presentation differently. But I want to read Philippians chapter 3. Listen closely as I read the 21 verses here. It's going to take me a little time. But listen <clears throat> where we see Paul writes and says, Finally, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble for me, and it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. Basically, he's saying, be careful about false teaching and deception that's out there. We read on verse 3, For we, who are followers of Christ, are the true circumcision, who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus, and we put no confidence in the flesh. 
Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I find more, far more, Paul says. Why? I was circumcised the eighth day of the, of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. In other words, he stood on top. He was in the top of, the, of, of his class, so to speak, amongst the Hebrews. He says, as to the law, I was a Pharisee. I obeyed the law very carefully. As to zeal, I was a persecutor of the church. I was solid in Israel, in, in, in Israelite teaching, in Hebrew teaching. He says, as to righteousness, which is in the law, based on the law, I was found blameless, he says. But then he says, but whatever things were gained to me, these things I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ, on behalf of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, but garbage, so that I may gain Christ. We'll explain that a little bit better in here in a little bit. And, and he says, and I count them as rubbish so that I may be in Christ and may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived by the law, which was true for Paul, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God purely on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. In order that I may attain, I might reach to the point of resurrection from the dead. You know, Paul's saying, I want to understand, I want to experience the power of the resurrection that raised Christ from the dead. I want the Holy Spirit to be that powerful in me, Paul says. And then he says, um, <clears throat> now, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect or completely mature, but I'm pressing on so that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. He says, I, I, I was saved for a purpose. Christ doesn't just save us, boom, you're saved, you're forgiven. Well, there's a purpose behind it. So he says, I want to lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. That's something that all of us should want. Now he says, brothers, brothers and sisters, do not, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind the things past and reaching forward to what lies ahead, the promises God's made, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, may God reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we've attained. He closes the passage out, verses 17 through 21. Brothers and sisters, join in following my example. Paul can say that. We should be able to say that to people, but sometimes our examples aren't exactly what they should be. But he says, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us, that example you have in us. For many walk, of whom I've often told you, and now I even say it weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things, he says, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion, the exercising of the power that he has even to subject everything, all things to himself. We're going to try to explain these things. This is a powerful passage of scripture. And basically what I want us to realize is that we should abide and abound in hope. This passage is a, is, is, is a, is a uh, reflection of what Paul is saying that point us toward hope, hope in Christ. And that, that's such an important aspect. So, first we look, and we're going to look at the passage piece by piece and in different segments. We see, first of all, Paul reminds us. In fact, all the points are going to say Paul reminds us of this. 
He reminds us to rejoice in our relationship with the Lord. To rejoice in our relationship with the Lord. Now, why is this helpful to us? We're going to explain later what it means to rejoice in our relationship with the Lord, but why is this helpful to us? He tells us. He says, first of all, reminders serve as a safeguard or protection for us. To be reminded, to be told something, and be repeatedly told it, that's something that God has counted as important, number one. But number two, it's a safeguard, it's a protection. It, it, it builds into our lives in some way where we're remembering the things that are most important. It's like we say, Psalm 119, verse 11, we've hidden God's word in our hearts that we might remember, that we might know what it says, that we might have those reminders that, okay, when this particular situation, I, I face this situation, that I need to rely on God's word to help me deal with it properly. So reminders serve as a safeguard or protection for us. But now I also want us to see that focusing our eyes on Christ Jesus forces us to fix our hope on the future. Focusing our eyes on Christ forces us to fix our hope on the future. I'm reminded of Hebrews chapter 12, where it says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who set for the joy set before him, endured the cross. He despised the shame. And now he sits at the right hand of God the Father. And that from there, he's going to come and receive us to himself. So when I fix my eyes on Jesus, it reminds me that Jesus died for me. It reminds me that Jesus provides for me. He forgives me. It reminds me that Christ is coming back to get me. And therefore, reminders to rejoice in our relationship with the Lord. What's the most important relationship in our lives? It's with the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, my relationship with Donna, my wife of almost 47 years, very important. She's precious to me. And, and, and she's, you know, only Jesus Christ is put ahead of her. And, and the reality is Jesus Christ must be ahead of her because Jesus says we should put him first. Seek first his kingdom. Seek first his righteousness. Seek him to be the center of our lives. So Paul reminds us to rejoice to be excited, to be celebrating that relationship with Jesus Christ. And you know what? We get so bogged down by so many things in this world that many times our relationship for Christ takes a back seat. And suddenly when it takes a back seat, suddenly certain things begin to develop, certain habits begin to develop in our lives that aren't necessarily healthy, that aren't necessarily spiritually good for us. So we realize focusing our eyes on Christ Jesus forces us to fix our hope on the future. Because we remember, he died for us, he paid for us, he forgave us, he's coming back to get us, he will judge us at the judgment seat of Christ. So we focus on the future, and there's going to be glory in all of that. That's going to be great. But now, next, we see in this passage that Paul reminds us to resist. We need to resist. And there's basically three ideas that I think he communicates throughout the context of this whole passage that we need to resist. And I'm going to explain the resistance first, and then I go to a third point that's going to explain, okay, we've resisted. What does that do for us? But as I say that, I want us to realize that we resist the problem of false teachers who twist the gospel of God's grace. Notice what he said here. He said... Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. The dogs, basically, they were the Gentiles. They were the Gentiles that taught immorality. They taught false teaching. They taught things that were not necessarily in any fashion connected to Jesus Christ. They'd push that, they'd push that, they'd push that. And Paul's saying, beware of the dogs. And he says that word dogs... You know, dogs in that day and age, they were oftentimes looked at as something very, very vicious. And it's interesting to note that the Jewish people, they considered the, the Gentiles to be the dogs. They looked at them as something that was going to basically show them or lead them in a wrong direction. Now, as I see that, say that today, the Gentiles are the ones that are presenting the gospel. Romans 9, 10, and 11, we who are in the church, the Gentile church... We are providing the gospel to people all around the world, at least we should be, and we're seeking to 
provide for what's going to happen in days ahead where it says the Jewish people are jealous over what the, what the Gentile church was able to have. And, you know, we, we understand that, but beware of the dogs. Beware of the, uh, of the evil workers, people that have an evil, deceptive mindset that try to lead us astray. And then the false circumcision, those that basically are, are adding works to the gospel. And essentially, two ideas here. Watch out for deceptive influences, but then also watch out for displaced confidence. If I place my confidence in the wrong thing, and Paul talks about that here. Confidence should be in the Lord Jesus Christ and in Christ alone. And if we add works, I think he's talking about two aspects of twisting the gospel. The adding works, we have to understand we can never earn our salvation with the law. The works of the law do not save us, so we don't add works. But secondly, if we subtract works, there's some people that they take works out of the gospel. And when they do that, what they're doing is they're leaving, away, uh, leaving behind the idea of things that give glory to God. So the subtracting works or adding works, either one, that's on the sides. Those are extremes. The gospel is we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Watch out for anyone that, dis that, that depreciates or, or destroys the, the truth of the gospel. But now secondly, we resist the possibility of looking in the wrong direction. And basically in verses 14 through 12 through 14 here in this passage, I'll go back and review those. He says, not that I've already obtained what? the resurrection to the dead or the perfection or the maturity that's coming when Christ comes to snatch me up. I have not obtained it or have not become perfect, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, I forget what lies behind. I forget the past. I'm forgiven of the past and I move forward. I move forward to what is waiting for me. And basically, we need to resist the possibility of looking in the wrong direction for hope, looking in the wrong direction for satisfaction, looking in the wrong direction for security. We need to be careful about that. And as we look at the past, Paul, he says, I, of all people, I was a, a Pharisee. I was a Jewish person that had so much righteousness because of the, the life that I lived. And, you know, some of us who might say, well, my past... How, well, how do I look at my past? Does my past drag me down? Does my past lift me up? How does my past affect me? Do I have various triggers that take place because of my past that cause various problems? He's saying, forget the past. Forget it. Don't look in that direction. But rather, we need to focus on looking forward to the future blessings and promises and prophecies that the Lord has made. We've got to recognize the possibility of looking in the wrong direction. If we get too much focused in the wrong direction, we need to, we're not going to see what does God have in store for us. We're not going to see the opportunities that he gives us to serve him effectively. So that's a second resistance. But a third resistance is we need to resist the examples of people who profess to know Christ, but their focus is fixed on earthly reward rather than heavenly treasures. Notice what he says here. Brothers and sisters, join in following my example and observe those, observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk of whom I've often told you, and now I tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. He says their end is destruction, their God is their appetite, and their glory is in their shame. They do things that are shameful, and yet they find glory in that. We see that in the world every single day. If we go online, and uh, not be careful when you go online, you're going to see things you maybe shouldn't. You're going to find things maybe that are going to be corruptive. But when you read the news, you see how there's a glory out there amongst our culture and our society in things that are shameful. And that, that's, that's, a, that's a difficulty. That's a destructive aspect. Just this past week, the state of, of Ohio, they, they codified the whole concept of abortion in their, in their constitution. And I believe that the Bible teaches that 
That is something that, that, that God basically, he, he, he's repulsed by that. And, you know, he, he, he's bothered by, by these types of things. And basically, there's going to be ramifications spiritually because of that. But the examples of people who profess to know Christ, but their focus is fixed on earthly reward rather than heavenly treasures. And I think it's important for us to realize that we live in the midst of a culture that denies the power of the resurrection. And Paul had said earlier, he says, I, I look at the power of the resurrection. I want that as my, in, my, in my life. But in this world that we, where people deny that, basically Paul expressed grief from the results of what is called an earthly agenda. Where the treasures here of earth the things we receive here on earth, the things we love here on earth, the things we enjoy here on earth, we look at that so satisfactorily. We look at that so much with so much uh, of a sense of a desire that we're losing sight of the heavenly rewards. Jesus says, don't, don't bring your treasures here on earth as something that is most important, but rather send your, your treasures ahead to heaven. And basically, Paul says, these are enemies of the cross, and they're in our midst. They're part of our lives. Now, we, we, we should treat them with a sense of desire to share the gospel. We should want to share the good news with them. We don't resist them or reject them in a sense of, I can have nothing to do with you because we want to share the gospel. But we need to resist the example they have on our lives, the influence they have on our lives. Oftentimes, these people are not genuine believers. They're people that profess Christ. They profess knowing him, but it says their end is destruction. They claim to know Jesus Christ, but in fact, their lives don't, exa don't, don't exhibit that, that, that the Holy Spirit exists in their lives, that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. And basically, it says they're driven by idolatry. They're, they're bringing up idols and worshiping these, these false gods Gods of money, gods of pleasure, gods of luxury, gods of comfort, gods that are so much an attraction to all of us. I like comfort. I enjoy certain, certain things that I found in the past. They can become idol, idolatry to my, to my life, and i got to be careful. So we need to resist the examples. But now finally, last point. Paul reminds us to reach for the glory that God has promised. To reach for the glory God has promised. Note what he said here. He's, I strive. Basically, what he's describing here is the idea of we're running a race. This is much like Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. We run a race. We, we get rid of all the encumbrances. We get rid of all the things that hold us back. And we run the race with a sense of endurance, a sense of perseverance. We run the race with a sense of desire to move forward for the sake of becoming more like Jesus. And we recognize that along the way, Christ has various things that he's given us to do, things that he's doing in our lives as well. And we, we, we reach for the glory that God has promised. In the midst of a culture that denies the power of the resurrection, we're called to represent the Lord as ambassadors. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says we're ambassadors for Christ. We're ambassadors for Jesus Christ. What's that mean? We are people that are living in a foreign land. It says in this passage, our citizenship is in heaven. I'm a citizen of heaven, even though I'm a resident here on earth. And I'm an ambassador for Jesus Christ while I'm here. We represent the Lord as ambassadors, looking forward to being resurrected with glorified bodies. Glorified bodies. We live here, but our citizenship is in heaven. Notice what this says. He's like, press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of Christ Jesus, upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as are perfect, have this attitude, and if anything, you have a different attitude, may God reveal that to you also. However, let us keep living by that same standard to which we've attained. We've, we've reached this level of spiritual maturity. Let's keep pressing on. He's telling us that. And you know what? Spiritual maturity, growing in Christ, that is very much, it is a God-given blessing to us. God helps us grow up. God leads us in that spiritual growth. The Holy Spirit 
provides what's necessary, the fruit of the Spirit, the produce of the Spirit. But let's realize that's our response. We need to respond to what the Scriptures say. We can't rely upon others to grow spiritually. We need to rely upon the Holy Spirit and on God's Word so that we grow spiritually. But we live here, our citizens in heaven, we're foreigners. You know, it's interesting, the Philippians were exactly that as well. They were foreigners in a strange land. They were Roman citizens, but they didn't live anywhere close to Rome. They were a Roman colony, the, Philippi the Philippians were. And when Paul said, to, said you know, we're, we're citizens of heaven, they understood they were citizens of Rome, even though they weren't even close to Rome. And that analogy for them was something that, that it resonated with them, at least it should have. And therefore, the Philippians are told, you are citizens of heaven if you're followers of Jesus Christ. And therefore, what are we waiting for? We're waiting for Christ to come from heaven to receive us to himself and to rescue us from this world, so to speak, the wrath that's going to come. But let's understand the analogies that Paul uses here. They're, they're, they're so multifaceted that we, we, we can miss out on them if we don't look at them carefully. This analogy, you know, he tells us that, you know, we are foreigners, we're ambassadors, we're citizens of heaven who live here on earth to, to represent Jesus Christ. And when we experience the fulfillment of Jesus' promise, he said, I'm going to come back and get you, John 14, when the rapture takes place, let's realize we're going to receive something that basically is the reason why sin came into this world in the first place. It says, when we see him, we will be like him. We will be trans... It says right here, he says, our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform. That's, that's the word, that it's, it includes the word metamorphosis. And, and it, it, it basically, it's literally, it's a transformation that happens to us that we have nothing to do with ourselves. We are literally transformed into something different. And basically, these, these earthly bodies, if we're here on earth, if we're already in the grave, the, the body in the grave will be transformed into a glorified body just like what Jesus Christ had. It says, when we see him, when we see him and he appears to us and he comes to get us, we will be like him. And just think, we'll become just like Jesus and we'll be what caused the fall of angels led by Satan and the fall of mankind tempted by Satan too. Why did Satan fall? The angels in, pre -creation, in early creation times, the angels were there and Lucifer, the head angel, he led a rebellion against God. Why? He wanted to be like God. He was envious, wanting to be like God. And what did he do to Eve and Adam? He tempted them. Has not God said? Has God deceived you? Has God told you wrong? You can be like him if you eat this fruit. And they ate the fruit, and yes, they became like him in the sense that then they knew both the difference between good and evil, but as we look at that from a perspective that sees this in this passage, let's realize that we eventually will actually become like God. We'll be like him. And what's he saying for us to do here? He says, you know, our citizenship is in heaven from which we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We eagerly wait. That Greek term there, it means enthusiastic expectation filled with patience. I'm expecting it. I'm enthusiastic about it. I'm excited about it, but I'm patient. I'm patient. Why? Because I can't do it myself. I don't know the timing. I don't know the day. I just know that it's coming. And I think it's important for us to understand that as we look forward to that day, there are certain aspects of how that should influence our lifestyles. Now, I'm going to talk in, in, in another sermon later in this series about the judgment seat of Christ. My hope is I look forward to be, being in the judge, at the judgment seat of Christ. Why? Because I'll be standing before my Savior. But in reality, as I stand before my Savior, I trust that there may possibly be some rewards because of faithfulness that I've been able to fulfill through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
But there's also going to be a sense where the Lord's going to play the tapes of my life and I'm going to hear things of, why did you do that and why did you do that? Do this. Now, I'm not going to be condemned for my sin. I'm forgiven of that. That's a past tense thing. Forgiven. But yet, standing before the judgment seat of Christ, I anticipate, I await for that. And then, when I receive the rewards, what do I get to do? I get to cast those, those rewards at the feet of Jesus and say, Glory to Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. The thing is, is, this should change our lives. This should affect our thinking. This should transform our perspective on the way life treats us and the way we treat life the way we treat others, the way we respond to situations and circumstances. Christ is watching us. He's taking account of our lives. He has, as we could say in technology terms, he has a taping, a video of us, so to speak. It's not literally a video. Some way or another, though, he's going to... Going to, going to Hold us accountable for everything we've done. Every word we've spoken. It says it throughout Scripture. And I, I realize that, yeah, rewards are part of the process. But I don't do this for rewards. I do this for God's glory. I do this because He's saved me. And when I stand before Him as my judge, I realize, okay, He paid a heavy price. Hebrews chapter 12 Keeping our eyes on Jesus, focusing our eyes on Jesus, fixing our eyes on Christ, the author, the finisher of our faith, who endured the cross. He despised the shame that, that, that came with that. And he's now seated at the right hand of God the Father, waiting for the time. And that, that upward call of God that's in this passage, you know, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead... He stood outside the grave, and he didn't just, he, he, he specifically called for Lazarus. Lazarus, come forth. Why did he do that? Because that was the call of resurrection. He raised Lazarus from the dead. And when Jesus Christ comes to retrieve us to himself, receive us to himself, he's going to, the, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus is going to be the call on each of us who are followers of Christ. And we're going to be either resurrected or we're going to be called up to meet him in the air. And that's going to be a glorious day. So that's where we, that's where we are in this, this, this whole topic of hope. And I just close with this final question. You know, wh where exactly uh, is our hope focused? What are the things that are our greatest desires? What do we want more than anything else? What gives us that sense of satisfaction and security? Jesus Christ. He's at the center of that whole particular question mark. And I trust that each of us can say, yes, Jesus is my Lord. He's my Savior. I want to be more like him. And I look forward to the day when I'll be transformed completely, 100% into his image. Let's pray. Father God, I, I just ask now that you'll help as this message is completed, help that we can stop and consider what it said, what the passage said. Not what I said, but what the passage said. Help us to understand how this affects our lives, how this gives us a perspective that, well, it leads us in that sense of humility. I humbly come before Jesus Christ saying, thank you. I recognize what he faced for me. And Father, Help each of us to live for Christ, to live with a life, live a lifestyle that, that gives glory and exemplifies exactly what a follower of Christ should, should be like. Help us in this, Father. Guide us in these matters, Father, I pray. I again thank you for your grace. I thank you for your goodness. And I pray your touch upon each of us as we consider the truths from Philippians chapter 3. So thank you. We love you. We praise you. And we ask every bit, all of it, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said... Amen. Hey, I appreciate you watching. Appreciate the fact that we have this opportunity, and I trust that God can use it for his glory. Look forward to hearing from you. If, 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 that, if, if you would want to contact me, please try. So, again, look forward to seeing you again soon.